Oh, shalom. Now we're able to continue with the part um, two to this, or the third actually recording, including the one with the Melkam Ledete Yesus um, and the, one of our favorite black um, Virgin Mary or um, black Madonna paintings by uh, Tim Ashkar that we showed earlier. Now we're going to continue with this um, uh, Shabbatical reading and feeding, which is from the 12th, from the 12th um, Torah portion reading and feeding. Consult the Sabbath house reading um, chart. The Sabbath house reading chart. Let's bring this up right here. Um, and we're at the point known as Tekemete. Uh, Tekemete. Tekemete. Te all of the good is of the first order. Tekemete. And Tekemete in the Hebrew is, um, they say, Vayechi. We say Wayechi or Wayeche. Now, there's a good is root and etymology that's connected with that that gives us and helps us get the proper Hebraic um, enunciation or pronunciation. And we'll hopefully we'll be able to touch on that as well. Now, where we had um, left off in the last part portion of this teaching, we'll pick up here. And we were speaking on Jacob. We were speaking on the patriarch Jacob. Now, in the earlier portion that we didn't go into as fully as we would have, um, as fully as we would have wanted to go into, let's move this over here. That was known as Vayagash. There is a hidden a Nagus. There's a hidden Nagus. Even in Vayagash comes from Nagash. Nagash. And, and as we have Yabahir Nagash, an old Ethiopic title of the one who either rules the, the, the sea, the ruler of the sea, or the ruler of that Eritrean, that Etara, northern Ethiopian port. But the word Nagash is also found prophetically in Isaiah. Isaiah also has the word Nagash, and we had wanted to, and was desirous to share that particular reading and feeding, or that particular um, um, note and commentary from the 11th uh, sabbatical portion from the first former former week, from the former week or the former um, um, samint that just passed, or subai, the seven days that just had passed recently, the 11th. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an asterisk there, and hopefully y'all will not be able to go into that a little bit more, but just for the record, um, Vayagash, the 11th portion, has a hidden Nagash link. When we get to the root of Vayagash, it's Nagash, and that's going from the Hebraic, and no doubt you can put a reference here in the Sabbath house reading chart. Um, and that was known as the 11th was Bamarinya Karabe, Karabe, as in Krav, Krav, Waga, Krav, to approach, Karabe. And now, there's so much hidden within the words and the meanings of the words that just when you decipher one or two key words in a sentence or names in a story, and then you read the story again with that knowledge and that extra data, it's like going from the old so-called TVs to the high D or the high definition TVs. You can see so much more detail. It's like 1080. It's not just... just um, 360, it's not just 720, but it's like 1080. It's like a, a higher resolution that you get out of the story, out of the reading and feeding, both for past things, present things, and futures, and, and, and futures depending all on the will and the decision, whether one does what they you know, will or whether they do the will of our father, Christina Abatachin, of the King of Kings, in and through his Christ. Now, what you're looking at is one of the Nuwabi in the Islamic Hebrew, um, Dr. York, pictures of, of Jacob. And we referred to Jacob and utilized this as a placeholder for Jacob. Also, we can use this right here. This is a little more color 
image of um, Ya'iko and set it right there. And you can see Bamarinya from the Ge'ez is Ya'iko Be, Ya'iko. Now over here, I think this was um, um, which Pharaoh, particular Pharaoh, this is also an artist rendition. I think a more modern artist rendition. Um, it could have been Thotmose or Sesostris. Um, but we utilize this as a Joseph, as a Yosef, a Iusef, a Joseph, a Joseph um, placeholder right there to get a little more accurate um, imagery and connection to the story. Now, this portion that's known as uh, Tegemete Bamarinya in the Amharic is quite interesting. And now here, as you will see right here, this says... Uh, um, mer usa re, or really, we always wonder why they always go mer usa re when, if you know the hieroglyph, this is a re. You understand? This is this is a re right here, um, and it would seem to be a re mer usa instead of mer usa re. The, the classical European Egyptologists they do that a lot, and if you can read it, it's like they're reading it. In, in, a, in a weird way, and they're telling us that you read it all in one way, but when they transcribe it, they transcribe it differently. I don't know if any of you all have noticed that, the, the Egyptologists or black Egyptologists, Afrocentrics, if you've noticed that, because this is Ray right here, but they tell us this is mer Usa Ray. But if you read this, it'll be more Ray mer Usa, Ray mer Usa, right? And this right here, says um, this is the ya, the two feathers, it's the ya, you understand, the ya, and then you have the, really the i here, the i is here, this is a i, more of a i, a i sound, so you have ya, i, ko, be, ya, i, ko, and this is ha, or the he, the he, and this is the re, or har, hare, or haru, which is an Ethiopic um, title, which means chosen or elect. So all this talk about Horuses and Herus from a Eurocentric perspective is quite confusing, especially to the Europeans and many of us if we're not rooted in our Ethiopic language, because from the Ethiopic, Herui or Heru is a name, and it means elect or chosen. It's a title as well. And that puts the story into much better context when we start to even look at ancient ancient um, Egypt, and we start to seek to reconstruct ancient Egypt according to an Ethiopic perspective. So this is the name that we want to focus on more right here, this um, Yaqub Her. Some say this is Jacob, Ya'ikob Her, Jacob right here. This is Jacob's name in a cartouche. Now, it's significant that his name is in the cartouche. Um, cartouches are similar to almost like a dog tag in a sense, but they was not dog tags in the same Western sense. But ones who were nobility or royals or ones of standing, like Kuburan, of some honor, they were ones who had cartouches. The poor people generally did not, you know, have cartouches in that sense, or the ignorant people, or the regular, the regular Joes, so-called, did not have cartouches, but it's a, a sign of nobility is what we're seeking to, to say, it's a sign of nobility. So when we now go to our notes here, let's bring up our notes right here concerning this Torah portion, reading and feeding, some of our selected um, Torah portion notes and commentaries right here on this uh, Sabbath number, the Sabbath number 12. Asara Hulet, the reading, Genesis 47, verse 28 to Genesis 50, verse 26, and confer, um, it's a Latin uh, literary expression, the CF means refer to the Ethiopic Lidet, and we know this as Amanuel, Amanuel. Now we're going to bring up the Ethiopia Kingdom of God calendar the Ethiopian calendar for 2004, the Ameta Mehiret. And if you look at this right here, um, you see, now this is in the Ethiopic ciphers, as we mentioned before, but this here says, Amanuel, this is the seventh. 
the seventh of which um, particular month. Let's bring that up here, and we'll get to the top right here, the top of this ca calendar right here. And we see this says Hulechi uh, Arat or Haya Meto Arat Amete Mehiret where Werich Werche Tachsas Zemene Johannes when Gelawi or the 2004 era of mercy, the month of Tassus, December 2011 to January 2012, the year of John the Evangelist, the Zemene Johannes when Gelawi. So this is the Ethiopic month of Tassus, of Tassus. Remember, um, December 21st, 2012 would be. Um, the 12th of Tassus, that's the same day of uh, the patriarch Yared's, Yared's uh, death and the 360th year of Noch, and a very important date because it's in the Ethiopic book of Adam and Eve, even pointing to the fact that it was preserved and recorded in the Ethiopic. So if you have the lost books of, of um the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Aden or Eden, you'll find that book in there and you'll find that near like the end of the, the book, the end of that particular book, the book of Adam and Eve. So bringing us forward right here, this is the 28th, the Haya, Haya Cement Ken of the month of Tarsus or the 7th, the 7th of January. So this is the Haya Sabbat or the 6th, the Friday right here or the Atse Iyasu Berhan Seged, the king, um, a king Iyasu, a memorial day for that particular king. Now, the Sunday right here, the Hayazetang right here is called the Be'ale um, Weld, or this is the ceremony, the first day, the ceremony on the 8th, on that 8th right. Now, Many would say, many, most Ethiopians um, have been taught um, that this is the Ethiopian Christmas, but the ancient Ethiopians know it's not the birth of Christ, but it's Genna. This is one of the, the connective um, portions to the Genna mystery. They know that this is part of the Genna mystery. Now, further on in our notes right here, we just began it off, and we said we just get into this recording right here. But the Genna mystery, because a sister of ours, she sent us a message, Melkam Genna, in the midst of us doing the Melkam Ledet. We prefer to say Ledet, um, understanding it as it is. But the Genna is a portion of it that confuses some people, and it's, it's like nobody can really answer, like, why we say Genna? And they said, well, there's a game that's played. Is that why we say Genna? No, why do we say Genna? So this is to address the Genna mystery, but there's a, there's a connective portion to the scriptures. As Christ says, have you not read in the scriptures? Have you not read in the scriptures that Jacob, Yaakob, that he reigned, that Jacob, our ancestor, reigned? And we can also use this, we say this is the Joseph-like, but we can also say this is Pharaoh-like too because we'll find in the Torah portion, I think this particular Torah portion, about how Jacob, how Jacob blesses Pharaoh. I think it's in this particular, yeah, Jacob's blessing is one of the, one of the matters that's studied and read in this particular portion where um, Jacob he actually blesses Pharaoh, that Jacob gathered his sons and asked them to listen to what would befall them in time. Now, okay, this is where he blesses his son, his sons, but there's also a portion where he, where he blesses um, Pharaoh. It might not be in this portion, it might have actually been in the previous week's um, or last week's portion where he blesses Pharaoh. And we thought that was very interesting when you understand that the greater is the one who blesses. In fact, we don't even bless Jah or bless God. We bless his name. And we say that he, we bear witness that he be blessed. You know, like blessed be the Lord, that he's already blessed. It's not us who are blessing him 
in the fullness sense of it, but the principle is that the greater actually blesses the lesser, but we bless his name in that sense. We increase his name. So um, Jacob blessed Pharaoh and left. Yeah, it was in this portion right here in the previous previous last week's um, portion where um, it says that uh, uh, Joseph told Pharaoh that his family had arrived in the land of Goshen. This is from last week's. This is from the Bereshit, the Bereshit uh, book, um, book uh, one. And let's just show you the cover again. And it's available at our website, book one. This is from this book right here, based upon compilations from the net, particularly the Wikipedia. Um, as a reference for us, a study reference, it says, Joseph told Pharaoh that his family had arrived in the land of Goshen and presented five of his brothers to Pharaoh. To Pharaoh. Genesis 47, 1 to 2, this very same chapter that we are in. Pharaoh asked the brothers what their occupation was, and they told Pharaoh that they were shepherds and asked to live in the land of Goshen, Genesis 47, 3 to 4. Pharaoh told Yosef that his family could live in the best of the land in Goshen, and if he knew any able men among them, then he could appoint them to watch over Pharaoh's cattle. So when we look at some of the pictures from the period in ancient Egypt, and we see um, these, these black men, you understand, with cattle and, and the different um, art and facts from ancient Egypt, no doubt we are also seeing our ancestors, is, and we're seeing the Beta Israel, and the actual proof of what the Bible is, is presenting a testimony here for us. Yosef set Yaiko before Pharaoh. Now, it's interesting, the word set, too. Um, and Yaiko blessed Pharaoh, according to Genesis 47 and 7. Pharaoh asked Yaiko how old he was, and Yaiko answered that he was 130 years old and that few and evil had been the years of his life, Genesis 47, 8 to 9. And I often like to use this particular picture here. Um, for an older, a representation of an older Jacob right here. This is one of the early Christian uh, pictures, um, paintings. Can't tell you exactly, but I like to use this as, as a contrast between the, the so-called younger and the older. Let me see if I could bring that, that other picture up so we can just use a little contrast here. Now, that picture is going to be important as well, too. So this is the book right here that we're referencing, and this would be like a younger Jacob, courtesy of the Nubian Islamic Hebrews, uh, Dr. Yorks and the Wabians, our uh, Sudanese brothers across the Ethiopian borders, a, a younger and an older. Now, of course, you would say, why does he look timid? Why does he? Well, if you know the story of Yaiko, we know he kind of went from being the, the black god, in a sense, you know, or the, or the dark one in the earlier part of the story, taking his brother's birthright on the run, wrestling angels, you know, saying, getting two wives, all this. You know, I mean, he went through a lot of, a lot of stuff, you know, saying, and we can see in his older age, you know, um, we can see that transformation almost of spirit. Now, there's an inter-rabbinic interpretation that's usually ascribed to these Torah portions and often when we have an opportunity, this is why we produce the book, we often would, um, you know, read and study some of the, you know, what some of the rabbis and the, and the others have said about it, and then go back and check out the story for ourselves and to see what, what's what, you know, see if, see if what they're saying is true, which means it's a remnant of our black ancestors, you know what I'm saying, that they have preserved, that the Jews have faithfully preserved, or if it's something that they might have introduced that contradicts the, the spiritual sense of the scriptures. But it's interesting, we found it to be interesting how um, Jacob, Yaakov, had blessed um, 
how he had blessed uh, Pharaoh, how he had blessed Pharaoh, and he had said that his days had been, you know, few, and his days had been um, evil as well. But then still, he is the blesser of uh, Pharaoh. He's the blesser of Pharaoh. So it makes perfect sense when we look at this cartouche. If we would bring up this cartouche again, we're just scanning through this. We wasn't able to find it, but we know that there's a little bit more on this in the particular um, book and manuscript that we um, have compiled for the first portion of um, the Torah portion readings and feedings. Now, this cartouche right here, this particular cartouche, it has been believed and speculated by many that this cartouche, the one on the right, is referring to Jacob as as a Horus figure or as a chosen figure. Now, if you're into the mix-up whitewash and Eurocentric, some of the Euro some of the Europeans are good are, are good Egyptologists. Some of them truly want to find the truth and the facts, but some have another agenda, and there's a lot of confusion that has been imagined you know, concerning the title Her or Heru, and we can reconstruct the truth of it from our Ethiopic roots, and we find that Herui or Heru actually means it's a name, but it also means as a title, a chosen or elect as the Heruyan. So if you're reading the Gutters, um Bible, you will find that the chosen and the elect are the Heruyan or they're the Horuses when you go through the Egyptologist perspective. Now, this portion being named um, uh, Tekemet Bamarinya is significant. So we'll deal with that first because Tekemet uh, means to sit. And so how did Jacob sit? Well, we find that he's a blesser of Pharaoh, right? He's a blesser of Pharaoh. He sat as king. Now, this image that you see, we call this, pole star Jacob, as we were saving certain images, the Spirit just told us, say this pole star. This is a pole star in Jacob. You, do you recall that in the scriptures there was a particular prophetic word that was used concerning Jacob when Balaam, Balaam which is representative of this uh, world system and the present state of um, the lost sheep? Because remember what happened in the Balaam story that what Balak learned, and we find this in Revelation, what they call the doctrine of Balaam, was to corrupt the people who could not be cursed. And when you corrupt them, you lower their morality, their vibration, and then they can be cursed. Really, then they kind of curse themselves. And that was the only way that Balaam could really serve Balak, who didn't like the Beit of Israel and wanted to curse them, that he could not curse them, the sorcerer, you know, their, their Merlin magician could curse the Beta Israel, but instead he was, um, I guess you could only say forced to give a blessing. And this blessing is a particular blessing that you might find it often quoted, often quoted by Christians and even by Jews, um, in particular to Israel, and it speaks about the star that there would be a star of Jacob, that a star would actually, according to the scriptures, that a star actually would rise out of, out of Jacob. And let me see if I can get this portion of scripture. Um, and, and this, I think, happened like twice. Okay, here is Numbers chapter 24. In Numbers chapter 24, Bela'am, the Baal of this Olam, this world, the prophecy of Peor, of Fior. I like to call it Baal Peoria. Um, and this is concerning the Messianic Kingdom. This part, part two now, is concerning the Messianic Kingdom. And he took up his parable, his misale, his encoclish, his simile, his example, his rhyme, in other words. This is, this is his bars now. And said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, just like hip-hop and rap, you know, one has to identify who they are, 
and what their relationship is to who else is important. So Bior or Pior must be very important. And if you study the name, you'll find out. And the man whose eyes are open hath said. And it says, he hath said, which heard the words of God, or Elohim, and knew the knowledge of the Most High, or El Elyon, which um, in, in the metaphysics would symbolize Christ, or the pre-incarnate Yeshua which saw the vision of the Almighty. The Almighty, in this sense, would refer to the Father of Yeshua, our Father, or Christina Abatach and Abba Kedus. It says, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. So Balaam fell into a trance. You understand? I know you're, you're acting like, what was he smoking, right? He fell into a trance, but his eyes were open. I mean, has that had, you know, have you ever got the buzz feeling? Uh, have you ever got the buzz feeling? Now it says, he goes on in verse 17, says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Yaiko. You see this right here? This man is sitting. He's sitting, right? He's sitting. And this is just like the, how they picture the thrones from ancient Egypt. You understand? Know Tekemet means, actually, if you look it up, to be enthroned. It also has that biblical, spiritual, and, and, and um, from a, a higher level of interpretation, it means to be enthroned. So as we read that Jacob, he sat in the land of Egypt for 17 years. How did he sit? This cartouche definitely tells us how he sat. He sat as king. He sat as, he sat as, as, as a noble one. You understand, or as a cheru, he sat as king, a king that could bless Pharaoh. Now, there's something very interesting about the story about the blessing of 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 um, Pharaoh as well, um, because you'll find that um, let's see, let's just crop this right here, concerning the story of the blessing of um, Pharaoh. Oh, there's a story that the Jews preserve. And a lot of this comes out of some ancient, some of our ancient writings, and we've proven some of it, and we'll prove others as 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 it comes becomes necessary. That a lot of it comes out of Egyptian and and especially Egypt. A lot of the writings, so we find same story but a little different. But the whole the, the whole principle of it is already encoded in Egypt. So Egypt is an important part of 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 even God's purpose as well. It's just that the Egyptians, like so many peoples, or so many of us peoples, you know, saying, who have, have let the Almighty down in our previous story, and Egypt is one classic case, but Egypt is not the big bad boogeyman that some branches of white academic supremacy would make believe. See, it's the code for us to really understand the Bible, and it's true, spiritual, psychological, physical, and, and it's a racial context as well. So Jacob, this right here is, is a visual of what Balaam sees and what the prophecy that we find here and there through the scripture concerning Jacob and, and by extension, the Beta Israel truly is. He says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not now. There shall come a star out of Yaiko. There shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, shall rise out of Israel. And this is the curious thing, and we find that a lot of folks, you know, don't really explore this, but um, we wish they would, and we'll show his majesty right here, you know, his majesty right here, because this is connecting now this particular prophecy concerning Jacob and concerning this particular star. Um, that says, a star shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Of Sheth. Now, that was from Numbers. Let's see if we can bring this over here so you can see this. Hopefully, you've gone to your Bible and or at least made a note of it. So, we're going to go forward to Numbers chapter 24. So you can see this, and perhaps we can do a little bit of, of word investigation. 
a little word investigation here is and when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, um, he went not as at other times. So, you know, he didn't go at, uh, it's interesting Balaam's, Balaam's relation, because even though he's a sorcerer, we could say even though he's one of the Illuminati people of the old world, so to speak, that he even um, admits that, um, you know, Jah is over all, and he has to do the work of and the will of Jah ultimately. But now he puts this particular, here's the verse right here. You see, the children of Sheth, the children of Sheth. Let's try to figure out, find out what Sheth means. So let's go into the um, the Kutera Amatinya, and let's look at the Strong's uh, uh, Concordance words and look at Sheth. There's two Sheths, 80. 351 and 8352. Let's take the first first. So now we click on the first Sheth and let's see what the meaning means. It means Sheth. It's something like Seth. You know, it's like Seth. The etymology is there. And then Shait or Shait. You know, it sounds like Shaitan right there, right? Numbers from 7582, it means tumult. A tumult. A tumultuous people, Sheth. We can see the children of Sheth rising up in America right now, you understand? But, you know, there's good hope because that star, you understand, that scepter, you know, the scepter of the king of kings and his Christ. Here it says Sheth, Sheth. Then they have secondarily is concerning Seth, but there are more than one Seth, just as we can show you there's more than one Enoch. And there's more than one Jesus in the Bible. There's a bar Jesus who's a sorcerer, and there was our master, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua. So Sheth is a very interesting connection right here, but this is the verse. This is this verse that now is representative of this particular um, imagery right here. Now, the Genna mystery. What about the Genna mystery? I know we're talking about this. Some were saying you're talking about that, but these are all connected with this with the importance of this particular sabbatical Torah portion reading and feeding and this particular season that we, we are in, it testifies to those things past, to those things present, as well as to uh, futures. It testifies to that. Now, the Genna mystery, we need to go into the name Genna. Now, Genna, let's look at the dictionary we're about, we're about to publish right now, and this is called um, the Dictionary of the Amharic Language by uh, Reverend um, Eisenberg, and it goes back, I think, to 1880-something, 1880 1881-84, something like that, but 1880, huh? 1864. 1864. 1864. You understand? Don't worry about speaking up. 1864. Oh, yeah, 1864. No problem, but um, this particular dictionary right here, anyway, this particular dictionary right here, it says um, Genne, if you look right here, it has Genne right here. Now, this is going back to some of the good, you know what I'm saying, in classical Amharic, which might be a little beyond the purview of today's average Ethiopian because of, um, you know, all that has gone on, all that has prevented um, the people from knowing themselves and their brothers and sisters here in the diaspora. Here it says, agene, verb, noun, to be beautiful, glorious. We have agene, uh, in the active sense, to beautify, to glorify, to magnify, like from genene and also the word to praise, and one of the words that has a praise-like meaning in the, in the good is to praise, to celebrate, and this the psalm reference, XXXIV3, or 34 and 3, then you have Asa Genna, which is the idem or, or similar of Agenna. Then if you look at the secondary, the secondary insert or entry, we have Genna, it's a conjunctive. They say it's a conjunctive, and it means yet, still, not yet, especially with a negation. In other words, um, genna, genna al-metam, 
he is not yet genamatam. He is not yet come or genano, genano, genano. Like it is not yet. Now it's it's dealing with a time. It's not yet that particular time. Now some would argue a little semantical point, ignoring the etymological roots, and say, well, if you say it, there's gena and there's genna. You know, there's Genna, and that, that, that does make a point identifying which particular interpretation from the etymological root is being referred to. But the main idea of the, the Genna mystery is that it is not yet, it is not time. So uh, January 7th as a particular memorial, you understand, of the birth of Christ has two basic um, um, references, and this is what we're going to have to then put together the, the calendar, the ancient calendar, and then we'll find out, well, what took place where in the gospel story, and we'll see that heaven, that the heavens still testify to this, that we can use um, today's um, knowledge of uh, astronomy and astrology and actually, um, as they say, reconstruct the position of certain stars. Now, I don't know if I have this video right here. Let me see if I can get this video. This is from the Rude Awakening. I don't know how loud it is. It might not be very loud, but perhaps you'll be able to at least get a basic idea. And there's some calendars that we have here, too, as well. And this is the part eight that we were speaking of. Because we say that those of the Ethiopic Church or the true Tuahedo Church, we maintain a couple of main points, and we'll list out these main seven or eight points. But one of these points is that Christ, or Yeshua, was born during um, the fall festival season, or what's known as September 11th, on the solar, in, in the solar reckoning, according to the solar reckoning. And that this in Glamardium, his mother also was born on this particular day, and that January 7th, is when Emmanuel was announced in the sense of when the Annunciation occurred with uh, the Lika Malaik um, Kedusa Gabriel to Kedistin Glamarium. So the part of the, the Gospels where um, um, the angel announces to Mary that she will have a child, which was six months into the pregnancy of her of her, of her cousin, of her cousin, I think, uh, or her, her relation, um, um, uh, Elizabeth, who is the mother, or Elisheba, who is the mother of uh, Johannes or John. So this is from the Rude Awakening. Check this. I'm just holding this right here. Check this out for a moment, and we'll see how loud it is. And Until all these things were fulfilled. So... This is the day that was announced. Then Zechariah returned home to conception of Yehudah ben Zechariah uh, shortly after that. And then it says in the sixth month of Elisha's pregnancy, that's when the angel Gabriel came to Miriam in Nazareth and announced that she would have bear the light of the world. It was the end of the Feast of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Lights, that the announcement came. Now, now, if you notice something right there, uh, see if you can pause that right there. You know, this is this is from uh, Michael Rood's video, the Jonah Code right here, and this is just one additional proof right here. This is notice what the date is. This announcement, when announcement came, December, January, four to five B.C.E. You know, saying the the tenth, right around this particular time right here. So. We also have, uh, um, you could, like I said, on the, vid, uh, on the videos on the Internet, the YouTube, just part eight of the Jonah Code that particularly touches on the, both the birth of Johannes Matemku or John the Baptist as well as the times of the birth of, of Christ, of Yehoshua. And this confirms, this is another evidence that confirms the Ethiopic church's ancient um, testimony, the ancient testimony. The modern testimony is a little bit confused, but the signs are still there in order to de decipher it. One of them is, is part of the Genna mystery. It says Genna because it's not yet, but it's a preparation and looking forward 
and it was looking forward from the time of the Annunciation, and then also, Michael Rood points this out in this video, also when the shepherd, when, when the wise men, the magi, when the Maggie had come forward. See, people think that he was born, and then a couple of days later they came forward, but it was nearly a year. There's a whole year. People don't understand the real chronology of the events in the New Testament, and the chronology, understanding it, makes it even more beautiful. I mean, you really get to see the, the, the mystery, the prophecy, the, the spiritual, you see the richness, the layers of it. And unfortunately, um, in this commercialized society, people don't really get to see that particular fullness, but hopefully some, some of you, my brothers and sisters, will. So this particular video, let's play it. So this is around this particular time. Okay, so she, that was one particular video right there. Just a couple of the points that we thought were significant, um, particularly, and at least just laying out the basic the idea. The greatest story never told. The greatest uh, story Jonah never Cole. told. The well, Jonah called it. After spending about three months with her, at the time that Zachary, uh, excuse me, that uh, John the Baptist is born, it is Passover. The very time that we had set a place at the Passover table, for Elijah, the prophet who came in the spirit of power of Elijah was born at that very time. And then we go around six months, around the year, oh, but we stop off because not only do we have the biblical record of the things that are transpiring, but we also have astronomical observations. Remember all of the times that it speaks of in the Gospels about Yeshua's star, about the Chaldean astronomers seeing his star in the rising. What time did his star appear? What were they talking about? They were talking about astronomical observations that the astronomers were well aware of that we can go back in time and duplicate those very same moments in time. And that is why we can find out exactly when these different astronomical observations took place in the fifth month, and then the great sign of the heavens spoken of in Revelation 12, 1, which happened on the day of trumpets, and this was the major astronomical observation. Remember the day of trumpets, the first day of the seventh month, that is the day of the blowing of trumpets when we are to remember the Torah that was given to us at Mount Sinai when the Almighty shouted down His commandments. Well, every year the day of trumpets occurs on a day and hour that no man knows. Hmm. Because it is the only... You hear that right there, that the day of trumpets occurs on a day and hour that no man knows. So the lunar, because we have to observe, well, he's going to explain it right here. Now, this is the September 11th time. Remember, September 11th is a solar day. But we'll find that the Ethiopian New Year and the Hebrew Holy Day, the Hebrew Holy Days, the lunar and the solar, do line up. Every, every couple of years they line up, but we have the same very season. So there's a preservation for this in the Ethiopian um, church, the ancient church, the Rit It Hymenot, Beta Christian account. The only high Sabbath that occurs on the first day of the month. And how do we know when the first day of the month is? When the first sliver of the new moon appears after sundown. We don't know if we're going to see it, but we're going to watch for it. And when it appears, that moment is a high Sabbath, the day of trumpets, the day of the awakening trumpet. And it was at that point in time that this constellation, Petula, this is what was seen. In Revelation 4, what it says. Now, he doesn't show it in this video right here, but um, Betula, um, that is Virgo. That's basically Virgo. Now, there's an interesting connection with Virgo and Rahel. And Rahel is the matriarch, Rachel. And um, no doubt um, you've seen it in our notes that also what we wanted to touch on is the Rahel code because now there's a link with um, Rahel or, or Rachel. From If you notice in the Bible in um, Matthew chapter uh, two, I think, verses 16 and 17, or 17 and 18, it speaks about um, Rachel weeping for her children. 
and then we find that that is a reference to Jeremiah or Tinbeter Arimius. We find a reference there about um, um, Rachel weeping for her children, for they are not. Now, it's interesting how this particular testimony said so this was fulfilled by the prophet. This is what was fulfilled by the prophet, this was this, that the prophet spoke was fulfilled in the birth of Yeshua. So this is also connected with that particular season. Now, as we study a little bit more, we'll see the ancient archetype, this, this continual manifestation of a prophetic word from the most ancient times in Ethiopia, Ethiopia Kush or, or Ethiopia Egypt coming out when the sun was called out, the Bain Ha Elohim in the Old Testament was Israel called out, and we find a, a full cipher even in Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, and the scriptures testify that princes shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands to Ha Elohim. So the constellation he doesn't show here is known as Betula. Um, we have a number of pictures and things open right now, so we're not going to open it right here for you, but it's, it's, it's Betula in the Hebrew, but it's called Virgo in the Latin, or, or Dingum in Bamarinya, even with the Ethiopic reference, is known as Dingum. The Dingum is the constellation of uh, Virgo. And not the, a great sign in the heavens, a woman. And who is the woman in the heavens? Betula. The virgin woman. It says that she was clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. When the first slip of the new moon appeared that night, announcing the day of trumpets, the crown above her head of twelve stars is Ariel, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Not Leo, but Ariel, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Or we say the Anbessa. The Anbesa, or in some dialects, the Ambesa. And that's correct. It's not Ariel. They, there's other ancient names like, like it's, not, um, it's, not, it's not Leo, that Leo thing. You know, so even here, we love this, his preaching, because at least it takes you out of the Gentile, white Western, and more into the Hebraic root and truth. And if we know ourselves, we can, we, you know, we can fit it, you know, fit it together and get the proper um, color code and contrast. Between the feet of this constellation is a star called Amalek in Hebrew, which means the king. In Latin, it's called Regulus, legal, the king. Now, I remember we, we touched on um, Negus, or we mentioned Negus from the Nagash and from the Vayagash of the Torah, the Sabbatical Torah portion number 11 just briefly. So this is also in link with that particular constellation that there are Hebraic names. And when we understand the Hebraic names, then we'll be able to even rightly understand the Amharic and the Ethiopic names. And then we can properly align the story that we're receiving from a white Western or a, a Greco-Romantic romantic perspective with these particular different names. See right there, he's talking about Jacob. Jacob prophesied over his son Judah concerning the scepter. The scepter. Now, um, perhaps Balaam didn't see the fact that the scepter would, would be the scepter of Jacob, or of Israel would be in the hand of Judah, even the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he knew that that root now cometh from Jacob. Worship will not depart from between the feet of Judah until the Messiah comes. That star between the feet of that constellation is called the king. And at that moment, when the first slave of the new moon appeared beneath the feet of the Tula, announcing the day of trumpets, that is when the planet Jupiter, which in Hebrew is Hatsetic, came into conjunction with Amalek. Now, see, you have to understand that that particular star between the feet known as in the Hebrew um, um, Melak, or, or they say Malek, so even of versions Molek, if, if you are in that perversion of the ancient faith. But it's Melak, Negus. Now, he said that Jupiter is known as ha Sedek or, 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 or Sadik. Jupiter, remember Jupiter, Jah, Pita, Jah is the father, or the Sadik. 
the righteous, the righteous one, just to make those connections. That is when the announcement of the birth of the righteous king, the line of the tribe of Judah, was made in the heavens, announcing the soon birth of the Messiah. This is what the Chaldean astronomers had been searching the heavens for for 500 years since the time of Daniel, knowing that there will be a great sign of the heavens that will announce his birth, and they will then bring a treasure that had been put in their hands across the land and delivered into the hands of the Messiah. The whole detail of this is in the, I believe, the second edition of our uh, A Rude Awakening series, if you want to, to see all that. But we see that right after that, great side of the heavens, just about immediately after... I notice right here, I pause that right there. You see this right here, September, September, October. September, October. Now, I think he has, according to the, the theory of the Hebraic days, and we can't see it quite clear, but you can see this is the same very time that he's speaking about, announcing the birth. And so September 11th actually was a time, some would say, of those labor pains because we find that Christ wasn't, wasn't um, the baby, Yeshua, wasn't born when we, when we checked the scriptures and the, and the signs based on the holy days, seeing that Christ fulfilled the Old Testament types. There is until, um, until uh, tabernacles, that actually when tabernacles begin, or Sukkot, that's why Sukkot is so important when it says, and he dwelt amongst us. Like he took on our form in the sense of taking on the flesh of Kedistin Glamarium, the black Madonna, that, that Ethiopian that Ethiopian type, that, that black type, the true type. He took on our flesh, you understand? And he dwelt or sojourned amongst us. And also this is the beginning of that time known as Sukkot. And then uh, we have seven days. And the eighth day, the Shemeni Atzeret, this is, when he was, um, this is when he was circumcised. This is when the circumcision took place. Now we have the next year, as, as we're going through from January to September, nine months later. Then we have next year when we have the, the, the Magi or the Magi coming. They didn't visit him when, when, when it was in the inn, but rather, or like the barn, to say, like the so-called pictures and the make-believe um, um, Christian and church in perspective is, but we get to see that according to the Bible, they were in a house. They were in a house. They had already returned from that. So some time had transpired that is there in the Bible, if you know how, if you, if you read it properly. If you just rush through and don't pay attention, you'll miss it. But if you read it properly, you'll see that that detail is there, and in, even in many of the translations. In those days. They leave for the Feast of Sukkot. Now, why are we leaving for the Feast of Sukkot? Because everyone goes up to the feast. And the prophet Malachi, uh, Micah, has said the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So even though they are living in Nazareth, they are Netzers who are living in Nazareth, yet the whole town is Bethlehem. They know the Messiah is going to be born there, but it's also another very significant date. This is the year in 3 B.C., which is the 25th year of the reign of Caesar Augustus. According to the Roman records, that year, everyone in the empire was required to register their support for naming Caesar Augustus the father of the Roman Empire. Hmm. Now, it's amazing what in Rome has not been destroyed, because I was able to get a photograph of this at a construction site. This is a statue of... Imperial Caesar Divine Augustus, the father of our country. This is what is still standing in Rome today. That is what was put up as a result of that enrollment in which everyone in the empire had to register their support for naming him the father of the Roman Empire in the 25th year of his reign, which was in three before the Common Era. All right, that's that's just a little portion of it because we mentioned it before, but we thought it would be good to at least give you a a, a, a look at it. And I know the sound wasn't as loud as we would like, would have liked it to have been, but to get a basic look at it to see now 
why Genna is called Genna is because it wasn't just yet. Remember, um, her her cousin were, was in the six months. Elizabeth was in the the um, the, the the six month of her pregnancy. You see, what I'm saying so. It's not yet, and and it was not yet. You, you see, so the idea of Genna and then the inner part of the story really now starts to link it together. And part of that mystery basically is 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 in the you could say the seminar work, the seminar work of it, and the background of the story. Yet it, it still is related directly to the birth of Christ, because Annunciation is a very important aspect, even though it said that she shall give birth to a child. She did not give birth to a child right then. You know, the Almighty has the power to, to, to say be, and it is, but still it had to go through those nine months. And so we count nine months from the time that we regard as, the, the according to the solar reckoning, the memorial for it, which is January 6th, January 7th. Then we have September 11th, but then we look at the Hebraic calendar. That's what now really now gives us that half of the story. Remember Christ, even after the resurrection, after all the teaching, he had to teach the people and his disciples again um, the law of Moses and, and the Psalms and, and the prophets and to open their understanding or their overstanding of the scripture. So that there are other codes and there are other keys that are hidden within the scripture but are meant to be, to be found. Now, we're going to pause it here because we've been going almost about an hour on this particular um, reading and, and reasoning right here. There's some other aspects that we want to also touch on and um, some other aspects we want to touch on. So just to con conclude and to, to wrap this up, let's once again establish that the Tekemet part, which means and he sat, is not just referring to that he dwelt in the land, but in what manner he dwelt in the land. And this was a time when the, when the Israelites had prospered in the land of Egypt, even more so than the so-called native people or the native Egyptians or the other rulers that were there, the other people that ruled there. But we must recognize these are two types of black peoples, essentially, speaking about the Egyptians and the Beta Israel. But the key difference, as Gerald Macy points out um, in his works, was not so much an ethnological difference as white supremacy and the Aryan philosophy teaches us, but was more religious, was a more religious or spiritual interpretation of, 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 of why we're here, what's what, what is life, you understand? And because you ask most people, if you even ask yourself, what is the purpose of life? It's interesting the different answers that people would give. And it's a very important question to ask. In other words, what is the meaning of life? Like what, not just saying what am I here for, but what is life? to really understand what is life. Now, when we look at the Hebraic side of the meaning, and perhaps we can sum up on this part here in this mystery of Genna that's connected with this um, sabbatical portion, we have, let's see this right here, we have um, the Hebrew and the Ethiopic. This is the Ethiopic and the Hebrew. Let's try to send to this right here. This is the Hebrew for this portion. The first words are or um why yhi, why yhi, or why yhai, ya eko. And now this is the Ethiopic. We ha ye we wahaiwe ya eko. So this is the g is wahaiwe. So we can clearly see between the Hebrew and the Ethiopic, this is one and the same. So when they say, oh, the Falashas, the Beta Israel don't know Hebrew, who are they kidding? Who are they trying to kid? I mean, here's just one of many such examples that we can give 
of, of phrases, of words, and sometimes whole portions of scripture that essentially is just like two dialects of speaking. Because remember, a lot of the Jewish or the, or the Western is, is not even 100 years old and traces back to, um, I don't know if it's Halevi or, or one of their... Uh, one of their people, the European people, who wanted to reconstruct a, a Hebraic sort of a language, and he worked during the 40s or some time. His name escapes right now. but So the reality is that that's a new thing. You understand? But when we start to look at the Ethiopic roots, we now have to give up. Because they'll say vayihi or vai, but it's not a va, it's a wa, wa hai. And so we have the essential same number of, essentially letters, but we get the root now from the Ethiopic. So there's no difference in the Hebraic and the essential Ethiopic um, Torah portion name. But now the difference we find is in the pure language or the royal Amharic of the Met of Kedus where it says that Ya'ikob, Ya'ikobim, Begibit Amidar, Asura, Sabat Ahmed, Tekemete, that he sat, he sat for what, 17 years in a, in a um, position like a king, like an elder, like a statesman, like an elder statesman. He didn't rule Egypt, so to speak, you understand, but he had that honor, you understand, that honor and that, as you would say, respect in the land of Egypt. And through him and from his roots was a bigger picture to be revealed. Now, the next portion of this, of this particular sabbatical, because the connection between Sabbath number 12 and this being 2012 and this being the Ethiopian uh, uh, Christmas or Lidet, Lidet to Iesus, the birth of Yeshua, known as the Christ or the Moshiach, is very, very significant in and of itself. The connection with the ancient Hebraic calendar, even as Michael Rood in his Jonah Code, as he discloses it and gives, and gives much detail to it, further prove what some of our own brothers and ones like the Nebuchadnezzar, Arimius, or Aramaeus, Arimius, also has um, documented preserving the roots of the true Ethiopic church and explaining to us our story and the true apostolic teaching of the church. Because a lot of, there's been a lot of Egyptian um, orthodoxy um, um, domination of the church for 1,600 years. We've spoken the, on this um, previously, and it was his imperial majesty who, um, like the Most High did for Israel, he brought the Ethiopian church out of Israel, out, out, of, out of Egypt, brought Israel the biblical prophetic Israel in holy Ethiopia, the church out of Egypt from Egyptian orthodoxy um, domination. And there's some key differences between the present so-called orthodoxy as its practice and the ancient Ethiopian church's teaching. And many Ethiopians who are either old enough, wise enough, or aware of these things have testified to many of the differences that they have witnessed um, in such things as the liturgy of the church and removing of words, whether his majesty's name in the scripture, or even, even, even worse things beyond that has occurred, not to mention these so-called counterfeit Roman influence, Vulgate and Rams, uh, Douay Rams, that's the Jesuit Bible influence, Good News Bible, 1980 perversions, and the, the preventing us of um, receiving the Metzhaf Caduce, His Majesty's version, or trying to stop the printing of that that has gone on. So we're going to continue with this a little bit more, but we want just to wrap up this particular point. And once again, uh, Melcom Lidet and, and uh, uh, Genna, you understand, or Melcom Genna. But hopefully you will be a little more aware of some of the, the deeper meanings 
to to Genna and the Genna mystery as it has to do with the big picture um, and the true interpretation of what we have preserved in the Wengel or in the Gospel of Getachina Menhanetachin Jesus Christos, our Black Lord and Savior, Yehoshua Ha Moshiach. So until we um, reason again, um, we say uh, Shalom and be well during this holy day, holiday season. And we hope to reason with you soon. So stay tuned. There's more to come. Yah willing. Shalom. Rastafari.